Hi, everyone. Hey, guys. Welcome. Hey, Zach. Hey, what's up? Good. Hey, Jonathan, Lindsay, Allison, Tracy. Tracy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lindsay Garcia. I am the publicist for Meadowlark Press and the poetry editor for our poetry press. We also have Tracy Million Simmons here, our publisher. Hey, Tracy. We are celebrating the brand new 2024 Birdie Poetry Prize winner tonight. And we realize this is our sixth Birdie Poetry Prize in our 10 years of existing. So that's very exciting. And I congratulate all who have submitted and who have won and who have been finalists and semi-finalists. Um, this is just, just, just the best. So Meadowlark Press, um, like I said, it's in our 10th year. We're based in Emporia, Kansas, and we publish everything from fiction, nonfiction, children's books to poetry. Um, this is the primary poetry event of the year, but we publish a few other manuscripts as well throughout the year. So we'll publish the finalist and we will publish a couple who have been um, selected from our open pool of submissions. Most of all, just thank you so much for being here. Um, these are very special poets to me, and I think that we've really built a beautiful Meadowlark family and Birdie Poetry Prize crew. Um, it's a very special event, and it would be a lot less special if you weren't here celebrating it with us. So thank you for making it extra special. Thank you, Lindsay. It is so good to see so many of our poetry lovers here this evening. And it's very exciting to be presenting our sixth Bo Birdie Poetry Prize this year. I had to go look at the books to count because I really feel like we just started. And here we are at six already. Um, we have 10 books on the shelf, Birdie Books with our winners and our finalists included. And just it's so much good poetry. The quality and the quantity of the poetry that comes in, it just blows me away. Um, this has been a really fun project to work on. Um, real quick, I want to go ahead and take a moment to congratulate Mary Mercier, who was the 2023 Birdie Poetry Prize finalist. Her book, Five Reports of Fugitive Dressed, is complete, and she is launching with an event in Madison, Wisconsin on Tuesday. So um, that event will be live streamed via Crowdcast, and I would invite you all to join Mary, um, either virtually or in Wisconsin if you're close. And um, just take a look at that beautiful book that we, we've just published with Mary. Um, thank you to everyone who entered our contest this year. Um, thank you for sharing your work with us. And I can never say thank you enough, of course, to Lindsay Garcia, whose belief in medical art kind of rivals my own. She serves as our uh, press publicist and our poetry press editor. And we would not be where we are today without her. So thank you. Thanks, Tracy. This is my dream job. I love Metal Arc. <clears throat> um, all right, folks. So we are going to have four of our previous winners do a reading for you, and then we will open up for a Q&A at the end. Our first reader is our 2023 winner, Zachary Lundgren, with his debut poetry collection, Turkey Vulture. Originally from Virginia, Zachary earned his bachelor's from CU Boulder and his MFA from the University of South Florida. He's back in Colorado now, living in Denver, ice fishing in my hometown I saw, and working at Colorado School of Mines. He writes poetry and gets outdoors as often as possible. Zachary, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay, for the great introduction. Yeah, we were ice fishing up in Evergreen, but um, had a good time, but no luck catching anything, so. Ah. Yeah. Never, never a bad time to be up in Evergreen, though, for sure. Agreed. Um, so yeah, so yeah, yeah. Just want to say uh, thank you to everybody for being here. Um, very happy to be a part of the Metal Arc Press family, and I'm going to read a few poems from my um, collection that won, as Lindsay mentioned uh, last year's uh, collection, Turkey Vulture, right here. If you don't have a copy, highly recommend you grab one if you get the chance. Um, yeah, so we're going to read a few from here, and then a few from my new collection that I'm working on, actually. So. Um, yeah, so let's uh, dive on in. So I'm okay. So the first one is called Youth. Near the church, there's a winter cornfield and a fox. 
Caught in the wire fence gnawing at his own leg. A slight bonfire. God, I wanted to walk but sat down beneath that aching oak, losing his mind in green and those all quiet little flowers. I did it. That's what she said when she called in her voice, bare feet beneath gravel, like running. I wonder if you would have had my mouth. Okay, um, so the next one is called Decemberism, which I know is not a word, but it's poetry, so that's okay. We can make stuff up as we go. <laughs> and uh, it's about the last time seeing someone. Decemberism. Dinner at the only restaurant in town. We watch one another like thieves. A hand over your chest. On your birthday, we engraved our names into your bedsheet. Freckles blossom. Then they rust when we fall asleep on the floor, your hair in wildfire across my chest. Walking home that night, you took my wrist for examination, a story told short. Sleepless nights ripen like raspberry vines. You look at me, and I still don't know why there are so many stars. Um, this next one, as I'm sure most poets have uh, experienced, it's where you like the title way better than the poem. So it's almost like the title is kind of the poem. So, <laughs> um, so this one's called, not to say that the poem itself isn't great too, but the title is just, you know. Um, so yeah, this one's called A Dead Deer on the Side of the Road with a Get Well Soon Balloon Tied to Its Leg. We buried Johnny on Christmas Eve. I sat in the front pew, caught in mouth with a new haircut. I watched his father sit up straight as a lie. The taste of prayer against my tongue, it's just a wooden sword. Oh, the black knight rides again. Um, okay, so this next one is called River Luck and uh, includes an epigraph from Anne Sexton. And the epigraph reads, love in a cough cannot be concealed. Even a small cough, even a small love. This is river luck. Don't think baptism. This is before all that. She said she wants to keep her hair dry. She steps down an O. This must be what spring does to trees. She steps down the muddy jaw of a river wanting my hand. So I give it to her. I give it to her and not even river water is as soft. What, re what reasons does this river even have for us? The river water takes her hips, her breasts, small shoulders they laugh carelessly in the sun. Even though we talk like children, there's a hint of distance in your face, but the good kind, like knowing. The river, it's always there. This poem only turns with time. There's no conflict here but time. It's the same as why our bones refuse to rot away. So this next one is from a series of poems in Turkey Vulture. Um, it's five different poems. Um, and they're, all the titles are kind of taken from this, oddly enough, a, a guideline book I found about uh, presenting um, swine to the Iowa County or not the county, the Iowa state fair. Um, so, you know, you never know where you're going to find a good title, right? So, uh, all these poems are, yeah, kind of basically loose, uh, basically based on my time in Iowa and I'll read you the last of the five, um, just as a teaser to hopefully get you to, uh, dig into this book if you haven't yet. So, uh, this one's called rule five. Once your trailer enters the fairgrounds, swine, unloaded or not, will not be allowed to return home. Summer is dead. Stop trying to talk to it. Take down that red sky so we can stack up the bed of this diesel truck, humming, anxious to cross that state line. Let's go. I was warned. They say that the prairie air can start your words until even the corn won't listen. Maybe that's why we didn't speak that day, the last one. Instead, 
We trace maps along each other's arms, the muscles and veins, freckles to remember. We sat there in the field of soy. There was a time for her mouth, and then there wasn't. The way her dress crossed over her knees made me think of wood smoke, a goldfinch drunk with flight. That's when she took a prairie rose and she planted it behind my ear with a limping smile because she knew it wouldn't stay. But we know. We know that just because the flower wouldn't stay, that doesn't mean it still isn't there. And I have just two more from this collection um, and then I'll do a, a few from the new one and then I'll, I'll get out of y'all's hair. Um, this one's called Nails. Um, I don't know if anybody else ever played Nails growing up or if you still do it, that's okay too, won't judge. Um, it's a very country thing. You put nails in a tree stump and you hit it with a hammer um, and you try to nail them down into the tree stump. Usually you're drinking, so that makes it a little bit harder, but this is what we did. So it's called Nails. <laughs> a lot of fun. It's when you don't have anything else to do. But nails. She hammers at an old stump, all Christmas stuff with nails and dusky field life off a bonfire. She misses. She laughs like how blonde hair plays in daylight. There's an infancy to our language. He walks over and he gathers your small shoulders like a stranger collecting firewood right off your back porch. Your hands, they itch at this. The firelight waits, it's sad. You go and piss your philosophy into the grass, the only one listening because no one's drinking what they need. Water is just not strong enough to wash that first nail out of your mouth. No one knows love until it's hammered right through your cheeks. And this is the last I'll read from the Turkey Vulture collection. And this one is called Justice. So there's one summer in Virginia growing up. I worked at a, uh, a dog kennel out in the country. And um, oddly enough, we had a horse there and he was a, a blind horse and he was just kind of hanging out. So part of my job was to feed him every day and he was awesome. So I decided he needed a poem. So this is about justice. The blind horse was so old that we had to water down his oats. My hair grew long that summer and June, she'll talk to you, but don't forget she's a liar. Spinning all this into something jeweled when really it's just dirt beneath my nails, gas in my brother's car. I hook the bucket of oats out to the fence and wait for him. Mosquitoes already. This is a type of love. Who gets to decide what is fable and what isn't? I lost faith, faith in the soft afternoon, stroking the horse's flank while he ate from the bucket. He had another summer, maybe. Out in that field, I told him that when I die, I want all my family and those I could never love to take me to a river and spread lunch out over my coffin. Bread, cheese, just enough whiskey. The river will keep, and I'll stroke the horse and feel dusk even with that sun. What is the word for firewood thrown into a fire right before it burns? It took me that whole summer to understand the horse's name. Cool. And if I'm doing okay on time, Lindsay, we, we good? Cool. All right. Well, then I will um, read just a few from my newest collection. Um, they are kind of more um, poems from my time in Florida um, when I was there for my master's. So the the locale changes quite a little bit. But um, yeah, let's see. Um, we'll start with a poem called Heart Killer. One. She takes a drink. She takes a drink like someone takes a stone out of a river. Her parents called from Cleveland to tell her that her brother died, broken by bourbon and endocarditis. I watched her and I watched her go cold. She takes a drink because no one's looking for God anymore. Digging holes, necks up to airplanes, nothing's ever found. Two. At her apartment, she plays a song on the stereo. Heart killer, sweet, sweet heart killer. Outside, the bay night smiles through Florida's closed mouth, black against her tanned skin. Hands and keys lost, these hallways are so loud with humidity. We don't talk about Cleveland. 
just hands as lips sing, undressing the city wild, the laughter stuck in our teeth, just like cavities. Three. I would drive back to her apartment, but palm trees and a flat tire and her naked shoulders behind a locked door. I wanted her to be a song I already knew, but she rewrote me. Wine is her heart backwards. That winter her brother died, the bay did not give a shit. Kick, fight, collapse. Wild ivy and cement fills over these neighborhoods like a hand over your mouth. Four. Everything she is not. Existential teeth, bleached, blue-eyed safety, a good night's sleep. Okay, um, cool. So we will, kind of a, a nice connective home from that one about the same person from Florida. Um, yeah, we'll follow up with this one and then I'll just drop one more. Um, this one's called MD. And there's an epigraph from the band Mineral, if anyone's familiar. Uh, it goes, it's good to know that we haven't outgrown the love we shared as children. So this one's MD. Even after she told me her brother died, I wanted to have sex with her. I never saw God with us against that brick wall on a Cuban side street, but I do believe in miracles. The ones you see clear as a car crash in the middle of a beautiful day. She took me upstairs to listen to the song she sang at her brother's wedding. I kissed her and then her teeth. Clo this close to the sun, her flannel shirt looked more like a question mark. And God isn't all that complicated. We dragged her mattress to the floor and I told her about my family, my brother, and then her face. Oh, she looked like she didn't want to have eyes. Things are always taken from us in this world, she tells me, whether we realize it or not. But if we look carefully, she says, we know that Jesus is there, simply taking back what we borrowed. A stranger's face, a bird's sky, the dreamless wake of a ceiling fan. Was it the same with her brother the night his liver quit? When will we be more than just another apartment door, unlocked? Against a brick wall on a Cuban side street, we laugh, almost choking on the miracle of why we never answer these questions. Okay, I've got just one more for y'all. Um, and cool. So this one is called Everyone is Going to Heaven. Why will we never have another Jesus? Why can't I just find him buckling a child into a car seat or walking a tiny trinity of dogs down the beach or selling newspapers off the intersection in a dirty shirt while love bugs sacrifice themselves at the cross of my windshield? Is it to ensure we are doomed to failure, the eternal itch that whispers we've done something wrong? If unbaptized children do not meet the requirements of heaven, I ask, what's the point of heaven? My friend never knew his daughter. She didn't tell him. He found out after from a phone call. Then he wept. He wept like each and every bird in the sky. Small. This can all look so incredibly small. Once, waiting in line for a movie, he told me he heard a little girl's laughter. And he wondered if she would have laughed just like that. Thanks. Our second reader is 2022 winner, Jonathan Greenhouse, with his collection Cupping Our Palms, which is a title that sounds like a tender offering, but it's also in reference to catching his kids puke. Cupping Our Palms is also Jonathan's debut poetry collection. He lives in Jersey City with his comedy writer wife and their two sons. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Greenhouse. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lindsay, for the great introduction. I uh, I was looking over um, the last two years and I wanted to make sure that I didn't read any of the same poems. Uh, these are all the, uh, wow, my connection looks kind of fuzzy. Sorry about that. Um, I was, uh, I want to make sure that they're all, they're all poems from the book, uh, from Cupping Our Palms, but I, they are poems that I've not read at these, the other two readings that I did. 
So I'm gonna, I've got five poems, uh, shouldn't take too long. I gonna, I'm gonna start with Circles, which is the first poem in the, in the collection. Circles. Try it again, she whispers. As I pick through the fish's bones at this beachside stand equipped with full bar with an earshot of a drum circle. Her middle-aged skin's sunburnt as she burns through her savings to lessen her sea-soaked guilt. This is 20 years ago and a dozen kilometers to the south of Tulum. She swims in a lukewarm pool of bourbon, her makeup a personal guernica, blurred blue eyes, the dazzling reflection of a naked bulb doubling as a commuter train's approach. Today, I'm the age she was then, my sons dipping in and out of the Atlantic, eclipsed by waves miraculously spit out again. They call and respond, are beaten and bowled over, tossed like salads, like sailboats by a sea spout I fail to foresee. Try it again, the absent woman repeats, as I lie by the surf, trying to write what happened, what I hope will never happen to mine. I'm ashamed for not remembering her exact features. If her eyes were really blue, if she insisted it may have been an accident. Her daughter high while stumbling along the tracks, a purse with her IDs flung from the body. Afterwards, I hugged the shore for a mile before finding it. A massive silence, punctuated by an MC Escher C. Black waves lined with white as they gently roll in. The full moon, a Broadway spotlight. Low flying clouds turning the world on and off, on and off, as if hatching existence, then drowning it out, sowing possibility with this fluid truth that everything's despair until hope ascends to the surface. Okay, and after that very uplifting poem, although I guess it is uplifting, um, sad and happy, happy, sad, um, Animal House. A dolphin backflips in the bathtub, sardines circle in the sink, a boa is curled around the shower rod, and a troop of capuchin monkeys claim ownership over our medicine cabinet. Up and down the hall, cheetahs sprint as a polar bear snacks on salmon in our fridge and penguins stake out the freezer. Our master bedrooms host to mating season to shrill peacocks showing off caribou locking horns, sea lion bulls shoving aside their blubbering competitors. Satin sheets get overrun by a snake den's slithering warmth. Walk-in closets become caves for a colony of vampire bats, bloodthirstily swinging from hangers. Our wooden walls now windows through which termites chow. And the dining room's a carnivore's delight, a place where prey fear to go, while lions, wolves, and crocodiles patiently wait beside the algae addled swimming pool. Regardless of our apartment's rare amenities, no buyer seems interested. And our pets too, an apathetic dog and an apop, apop, I always say this word wrong, apoplectic cat are no fonder of our menagerie, prefer the dullness of our back porch from which they stare at the advancing sea. Okay, and all these poems in Cupping Our Palms are about parenthood and about the, the joys and difficulties of parenthood. This is, except for, of course, this one, which is about childhood and about running into it later in life. This is called Unwrapped. One day, you run into your childhood, but don't recognize it. You buy drinks, get it so drunk, it throws up in your new car, paints the upholstery with the buttered spaghetti and carrots your mom used to serve you. Later, you run into your childhood, childhood, then back up and run over it again making sure it won't return. These gaps in your memory crumble like potholes in the asphalt by a seashore undermining you from beneath, sucking out the names of your long buried school teachers into the subterranean abyss, erasing every right answer from algebra quizzes you aced, from adolescent dates and gum-plagued cavernous cinemas where ecstasy depended upon your every right move. Again, you bumped into your childhood and feel a stir a knock at your mind's door. So you let it in, only to hit it over the head and toss it downstairs into a musty cellar crammed with faded photo albums and birthday cards from great uncles and aunts with intricate coin collections worth nothing more than face value. 
you're confronted by the realization your life's finite and soon coming to an end. So you board up your front door and windows, flee in panic at a stranger's knocking, seek shelter in the crowded cellar where you surround yourself with volu voluminous tomes of accumulated text messages. Then you pry open the ornate sarcophagus whose resident had been hastily enveloped, carefully endeavor to unwrap your childhood, ask it for forgiveness, plead that it unravel its secrets, but beneath the bandages, nothing's there. The next poem is a, uh, I guess it's a parody of Fire and Ice by Robert Frost. It is, it pretty much uh, sticks to the exact poem, but just with every word more or less changing. But it's the exact same structure. It's called Fireflies and Ice Cream. Some say the world will end in fireflies. Some say in ice cream. From what I've tasted from the skies, I hold with those who favor flavors like butter pecan or mint to savor. Though thinking back on stranger treats, a flapping incandescence of the two might be exact in terms of sweet to guarantee destruction too. And before I read my last poem uh, called Cradle, I would just like to thank Tracy again and Lindsay again, and also Bart again for choosing the book two years ago. And uh, thank you for all the stuff you do. And uh, I will continue supporting Metal Arc as, I, as long as I can. And I congratulate the winner of this year, who I will not name because it's still a secret. <laughs> um, and also, I will uh, also congratulate Zachary again for winning last year. And uh, for everyone else uh, who has won and who has been a finalist. And this is Cradle. It has a brief epigram by Lucius Aeneas Seneca, which is, the day which we fear as our last is but the birthday of eternity. There will be mylar balloons and pointy hats with strings attached below the chin. Party clowns, if that's your thing, will perform magic tricks, which you'll slickly solve on your own. Your children, now grown, will ask if you'd like another slice of pizza, of chocolate cake, and you'll nod, since your aching bones growing limber and elastic. Your wrinkled skin will stay wrinkled and you'll feel a little silly for having wished to tread them flat. Your parents, long dead, will lift you up, then cradle and rock you to sleep, will usher you into a dream from which you will never ever awake. Thank you, everyone. Our next reader, is our 2021 winner, Alison Hicks, with her collection, Knowing is a Branching Trail. She writes poems I wish I wrote. I was lucky enough to meet Alison in person in New Orleans last year for the New Orleans Poetry Festival. Alison is the author of poetry collections, Knowing is a Branching Trail and You Who Took the Boat Out, and she has many other publications under her belt too. In 1996, she founded Greater Philadelphia Word Shop Studio, to support writers in the development of their individual voices and practice of their craft through community-based workshops and private consultation. She lives in Havertown, Pennsylvania with her husband, Charles Griffinstein. Allison, please take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here um, with Tracy and the rest of you, and also uh, Jonathan and, and Zach. Uh, I, really enjoyed those readings very much and our winner to our uh, 2023 winner. Uh, so I chose poems uh, really uh, from my birdie book, uh, Knowing is a Branching Trail. Um, and then uh, while I was listening to Jonathan, I decided that I had to swap out and, and read one um, recent one because You'll see when I get to it. But I thought I would start with kind of the what I consider sort of the core poems of the book. Um, and some of you may have heard some of these before. So uh, I hope that isn't a painful experience. Uh, so I'll start with the title poem. This is uh, Knowing is a Branching Trail that Disappears into Variety. It is hard to find something you have not first imagined. 
Only a small portion of the world is known with accuracy, Darwin wrote. Eddie Akron's went extinct 541 million years ago. Their tracks can be seen at Mistaken Point, Newfoundland. They look like a series of parentheses laid inside each other. Soft-bodied, mouth and anusless, somehow they began to crawl, pushing disc-like bodies forward. They were hunting or escaping a predator. We don't know. We're not even sure they were animals. They could have been plants, fungi, or colonies of single-celled organisms. It could have been an accident, extending bodies into the stream, washed from their perch, like anemones pried from their rocks, who creep across sand to a hard surface. They might have stretched suction cup feet across a gelatin of bacterial mats, working to feel their way back. Uh, and this this poem was inspired by a wonderful book called On Trails by Robert Moore. Uh, and he actually uh, writes about Eddie Akron's as creating the first trails. That's, that's, that's So it's right at the beginning of the book. Um, but what really fascinated me about it was this idea that uh, you know, they may have been making a trail, they may have been go, or they may have been actually trying to get back. And I think that's very true uh, for us that, you know, a lot of times when we're trying to go forward, we're trying to get back. Um, so that, <laughs> that's what kind of kicked that off. Uh, this is Yellowbird. I want to believe in a world beneath this one, the bird that flies across the lawn is a messenger that if I follow her in my mind, I will come to a door. She will let me through to the underside of the world. I will look at my life from below, my husband and son walking the bottom of their shoes. Other times I think there is no door, nothing below. The bird flying bent on her own purposes, her color the outcome of natural selection. Nothing mystical, just the world working itself out. Hummingbirds are squeaking, dive bombing the fe feeder. I too, sitting right side up in this world. The bird keeps coming back, the bird speaking through me. The Oryx. I had been kept in darkness, had not eaten in some days. When they brought me out into the hall, men were feeding the blaze on the floor. It hurt my eyes. I squinted, turned away. They gave me the drink. I climbed up, lay on my back on the frame they had constructed. Light traveled, unfurling over stone. I reached my hand to meet the wall and waited. They showed themselves first as tremors, barely detectable below my fingers, growing as they came on, until the sound of their hooves was a roar. I stretched to brush their flanks, and as they passed, they became visible to me, and I marked them as they came on, their pendant bellies, tapered horns, their noses, knobby legs. They ran through the rock. To make others see, I marked them. Um, and this this poem was inspired by the cave paintings at Lascaux, France. This is kind of my little fantasy of how they might have been painted. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I play the cello. I, I played as a um, as an adolescent, and then I took it up again as an adult after not playing for many many years. Uh, when my son was learning viola, and uh, it. Uh, one of my favorite composers is is Bartok, and uh, so there are two Bartok poems in this in this um, book. So I'm going to read them. So this is Bartok. In the afternoon dark, harvest time, the road covered with leaves, the stranger with the wax cylinders has persuaded the oldest woman in the village to sing. Melody winds from her throat 
out through the fields. An umpa band is setting up on the green for the evening's dance. Chords spill out church doors. In the fields, men and women look up, white faces with their kerchiefs. Across an ocean, strange intervals carry shadows of late afternoon. Uh, one of the things, as in addition to being a composer, uh, Bartok really was an ethnomusicologist. Um, and he, there was a lot of, there was a vogue for Hungarian music, but he felt that a lot of it wasn't really authentic Hungarian music. So he went out into the countryside and the early recording technologies, you had these wax cylinders. I don't even know exactly how it works, but they, they would record, make impressions on the wax. And that's how they get the, be able to, to uh, record the, the frequencies. Um, and he would, he would try to get the, uh, the oldest people in the village to sing um, and, and get that. And uh, that really came into a lot of his composition, as well as things like umpa bands and church music. You can hear all of these things in, in Bartok's compositions. Um, so this is uh, Bartok in America. Every country has a music running underneath like blood in veins. To hear you must descend. In a country now lost, I traveled beyond edifices and artifice to dirt road villages, and then here, where I am in exile, a wrapper on a bit of cheese, discarded among so many others, collecting in the gutter. The wind blows and blows us with it. I miss the strange old songs. I should have wished to be a peasant in the Magyar countryside when I was a boy, instead of some performer pounding on keys. The music here of my adopted country, I can make no sense of it. Like some old married man, my ear has become indifferent, so finely tuned to one it must forsake all others. Kuzovitsky, out of pity, pity offers me a commission. I accept because it lets me dream in the tones my ear remembers. Um, and Bartok did emigrate to the US. He lived in New York. Um, he really hated it. <laughs> um, and he also he was also dying of leukemia, which probably didn't really help him love America anymore. Um, and uh, uh, Serge Kuzovitsky, who was a, a conductor of the Boston Symphony and a very big man in classical music circles, did actually uh, uh, offer him a, um, a commission that just basically kind of let him have some money to live on. And that, uh, and that resulted in the concerto for orchestra. So uh, it, was a, it was a pretty good bet, I think, to do that. Um, and now I'm going to read, I was going to read my poem, The Winter Magician, but I'm going to swap it out and read. This is a pretty new poem. This was written um, a few months ago, uh, but I was kind of inspired by Jonathan's childhood poem. So this is called Flea Circus. Your childhood taking place on the town common outside the windows of the Lord Jeff now the inn at Boltwood, somersaults and stomach aches, orchestra glued to their tiny instruments. Walk with Sahira to the reunion, long way, the long way by the high school, speakers thumping, only a fraction can be heard from people you haven't seen in 40 years. Let's dance. Walking back, tell her, she is the most verbally inventive person you've ever known. However, did you end up the writer, you think, feeling with he filling with helium, having her back for a few hours? You both have to leave early in the morning, drink Grand Marnier in a raucous sports bar, the only place you can find still open. You've admired the photos she's posted, say you'd like to travel with her fall into the perfect bed in the most expensive room you've ever stayed in, so tired and happy that overlooks the common where your past is attached to props by slender wires. 
Um, and I thought to, to finish up here, if I can find it now, where is it? There it is. Uh, I would I would read um, uh, one of the poems that I don't read so much out of here because mainly because it's really a collection of shorter poems um, and it's called Riffles. So I thought this might be a good time to do that. Um, Riffles. Uh, and they have they have little subtitles, so you'll know when each one comes along. <laughs> Riffles, midsummer. The whole night moon, three days off full, Katie dids, all to myself. Sense. It's not supposed to, the pattern of clouds on a cool, cool June day, the way things fall in place or not, you give them since they don't have to make and things happen no matter how many times you crossed, uncrossed, or rubbed the stone. Beach. The hole you've dug deep enough to see the waves. Turning down. Slow turning down, end of day, if you hike in the late afternoon, through the pines, maybe in snow. You might not even notice the dimming until lavender appears above gray. Stream. Melting into the stream, little fishes come and nibble. Can something be caught twice? Once a subject is chosen, is it possible to write of the same thing again? That's the rhetorical question I will leave you with. Thank you folks we're getting close to our announcement but before we announce the winner tracy is going to introduce our 2024 birdie poetry prize semi-finalists finalist and guest judge so tracy i'm going to hand it back to you 2024 semi-finalists um i'm i'm telling you if we were a bigger press we would publish so many poetry books <laughs> um we really have some wonderful, wonderful things here. Um, the Sign and the Flutter by Julianne Baker Bren. Road Rage and Other Poems by Robert Cooperman. We Have to Stop Here by Bill Garten. Evening Houses by Hunt Hawkins. Bent Cedar Mountain by Julie Hensley. With Concern for How Words Land in the Body by April Pemetiki. Trouble with the Moon by Mary Paulson. Come Back to the Dollar General, Harry Dean, Harry Dean by Jason Ryberg. Dear Letters in the Red Box by Sarah Stern. Dating with Disabilities by Lee Varon. And Land Brim by Sharon White. Congratulations to our semi-finalists. Our finalists are Witness by Ruth Barden, Say It's Hunger by Richard Lyons, and Dragon Year by T. Dallas Sailor. And I think some of those folks are here. We're going to take a bow. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and mentor, Karen Merriam Goldberg, who served as our poetry, Birdie Poetry Prize judge this year. Karen was the 2009 to 2013 Kansas Poet Laureate, and she is the author of 24 books, including How Time Moves, New and Selected Poems, out by Medlark Press. Karen is the founder of Transformative Language Arts, a beloved writing workshop facilitator and writing and write livelihood coach. I've had the privilege of being a student of Karen's. I've attended her workshops and I've marveled at her keynote speeches. And I am enormously proud to have published two of Karen's books. And it is an honor to have Karen as our 2024 Birdie Poetry Prize judge. Thank you so much. And it is my great honor to, um, to introduce the wonderful poet who has won the birdie contest this year. 
Alicia Rebecca Myers is a poet and essayist who holds an MFA in poetry from NYU, where she was a Goldwater Writing Fellow and studied with poet Sharon Olds and Kamilko Han. Her poems and essays have appeared in places that include Best New Poets, Creative Nonfiction, Field, Gulf Coast, Swim, December, Thread Count, and The Rumpus that lists itself sounds like its own poem. Her chapbook of poems, My Seaborgium, um, apology for messing that up, was selected by Kiki Petrosino as winner of the inaugural Mineral Point Chapbook Series. She has been the recipient of a Kimmel Hardy Nelson Residency for Poetry and a Looking Glass Rock Writers Conference Nonfiction Scholarship. And she has poems forthcoming this spring in River Six Sticks and Cider Press Review. She lives with her husband and nine-year-old son in upstate New York, where she helps high school seniors write their college application essays. Warble, her winning collection, is her first full-length book and was a finalist for both the 2023 Akron Poetry Prize and the 42 Miles Press Poetry Award. And I also want to share some comments about what it was about Warble that enchanted me and made me choose this out of so many incredible poetry finalists. Warble encompasses the poetry of connection to the life force, weaving and unraveling immersions into grief and birth, presence and yearning, mother love and father loss, blossom and flight. These poems are compelling, brave, intimate, and most of all, unafraid of telling the truth. I found that once I started reading them, I couldn't stop, and I was called back to reread many stunning dives into the tender and fierce edges of life, such as the complex compassion and addling, the daring and open water, and the breathless love of you ask me to tell you the story. The title itself, Warble, speaks to the in-between state, as well as to the bird, of sound trilling, which is beautifully echoed through each poem. I picked this collection because of how deeply the poet wrote from what Edward Hirsch calls the poetry of affection, the poetry that connects us to our innate and vulnerable humanness. This quality is so vital when it comes to working with the fragments of brokenness, despair, and horror around us to craft a life, sustain a community, behold the living earth with wonder and courage. It is my great thrill and honor to introduce Becca to you right now. Um, Karen, thank you. I'm I'm very overwhelmed. I feel like I need to take a second. That was so beautiful. And thank you for seeing that in the book. And I also so grateful for Lindsay and Tracy and everyone at Meadowlark and all the readers tonight, Zach and Jonathan and Allison. And I'm happy to be part of this family and very excited to have my book with you. You you all know as writers, it's so it's such a process writing the poems and then hoping one day someone will take the book. So it's, it's really overwhelming to be in that position. So thank you again. I'm going to read a few poems from each section of the book. So the book is in three sections. The middle section of the book um, is sort of the most important one to me because it's about the death of my father in hospice. And it starts with 14 line, 14 line poem and then it goes down to a one line poem and builds back up to a 14 line poem. So that section is 28 poems. Um, but I'll start with the beginning section, read a couple from the middle and then, and then finish at the end. So the first poem is called Ringer. I would never want to be 25 again, bandana for a shirt, parading like some fire breathing dragon prop that accidentally caught on fire. Now I am my own magician. Every morning, I pull colorful dog poop bags out of my pocket. The trick is I have lived. I buried a father, pushed a 9.4 pound baby out of my vagina. His head was so big, I begged my midwife to kill me. 
His crown appeared and withdrew incrementally until the hair stayed put long enough for me to pet it. That shift is so deliciously medieval, so wildly beautiful, I could never return to self-doubt. Switchback period of blowing clove smoke out the window to John Mayer, thinking, what did I do wrong? When I answered an ad to sit in an unmarked van and guard handbells for eight hours, I could have been making my own music. This next poem is a prose poem that is about my honeymoon in Libyana, where I ate a horse burger. And it is called Hot Horse. The guidebook said to look for an orange box. We strolled through Tivoli Park, past the pond, past the mansion guarded by its four cast iron dogs. Story goes their sculptor shot himself for forgetting their tongues. I, for one, will never forget my tongue. I take it everywhere I go. I wanted a fast horse, wanted to play karst to some fierce muscled lipizzan, to ingest via burger Gates tracery. We queued up inside the kiosk. You recused yourself from gloppy nacho condiment. I handled a bun big as a moon, the meat thin and tough and smeared with ashvar. My ring against the former runner glimmered. How to say this? Like a castle of gristle, like lake effect in the gut. My love for you, the inverse of the trapped feeling. I later read about the man who climbed atop the roof of his dead father's car as thieves sped it away and thought, yes. He held on ferociously, a herd of grief moving through him. This is how I cling to memory, the trees, just blurs. We met Tamaj by Dra Dragon Bridge for dinner. In the only photo I have of us, he's wearing a checkered polo shirt. To your honeymoon, he said, then sang the praises of the marinated horse steak. I ordered one. This was only hours after Hot Horse, two years before he died. There are boxes and there are boxes. I'll keep welcoming wildness inside me. Um, Throughout the book, I have several poems that reference like travel and being a travel agent. I was a travel agent for many years. And this poem is called The Last Travel Agent. She hides honey in a globe. Her hair smells of camphor. Mornings, children scatter heirlooms. Their fingers work the ash. Here is a mesh of lace. Here is a rope of felt. Sometimes the stones become the fragile cups and saucers she once laid out for friends. Remember the sky strewn with paper lanterns? The moon is anything other than dread? O oh, bird with one wing heavier than the other. Air splinters, like a Medusa head the capstan glowers. Geography is spent. Line them up, line them up. How does the fable go again? Enough stones in the pitcher and the crow can drink. Um, I will read the poem I wrote about gun violence, which I hated having to write. I wrote it after, I actually wrote it the morning after the um, Uvalde shooting. It's called G-Day. Today is G-Day, my son says to me, the morning after another school shooting he doesn't yet know about. The alphabet countdown has begun to mark the passage of time between now and the final class when second graders stream out the guarded door and into summer. We're learning about grapes, he says, and as I unknot his hair, hands shaking, I picture the kids in a crisscross circle, eyes closed, each biting excitedly into a succulent spherical berry before giving language to the pop, sweet and tart, or like jelly. And there will certainly be a child who thinks but maybe doesn't say the shape of a bullet, the way his teacher will keep her terror private, the way I hear in my head, G is for gun. Mouth to spring. Our foster puppy lacks restraint. He leads with his gibbous stomach. He gums first shoots and nibbles ephemerals. A favorite snack is glory of the snow, so named because it flowers early. For a canopy, he unearthed last year's Easter egg still hidden. When he's especially naughty, I taught him with stories of Six Mile Creek and Sapsucker Woods where fragile bloodroot grows. He's never been. Sometimes I talk to him about things that aren't so pretty, 
tell him how the branching nodules seen in a thoracic scan are called tree and bud opacity. The surprise. My father died two weeks before his 48th wedding anniversary. What ate up my mother was the fact that he had planned a special dinner for it, but never told her details. Just a sweet illusion. It's a surprise. I must have called every restaurant in the days following for proof of reservation. Strange to ask, do you have record of a past name? Wondering where they would have sat, his order, if acute leukemia would have stopped him from drinking beer or pointing to the slabs of beef wheeled out on a silver cart and saying, that one. But no one could find him, not the peddler steakhouse, not the Angus barn, not mandolin, not even red lobster. What a bureaucratic waste my grief made of time, how I held my breath whenever a person answered. And I will read um, two poems from the middle section, which is the starting with 14 lines going down to one back up to 14. This poem is called America Runs On. A man at Dunkin Donuts like my dad in profile lifts a coffee to his lips. Commercials call it Dunkin now, the Dun, the Kin. I'm broken in that ceaseless way a call no longer reaches him. Not long ago, I phoned the hotline printed on a box with my suggestion. April is the crueler month. Nobody responded. Okay. This poem is called Castles. How do I mourn a parent I loved but wasn't close to? I mean, how do I learn to let go of what I longed for contrary to fact? I guess what I'm asking is, if falling back is gaining an hour, how much time might be amassed by merely stopping? There are entire days I don't care to sing. Isn't it strange how blood transcends anger? As a travel agent, I once flew to Turkey, didn't bother to tell you, climbed terraces barefoot at Pamukkale, the travertine hard but powdery in places like sugar-dusted pavlova, calcium carbonate snow. My guidebook called them cotton castles. I was 28. I remember the far-flung thrill of illuminated pools, my sovereignty and my sovereignty in being a trace element. What did I know of distance? Okay. Um, so in the third section of the book, I have uh, a villanelle called Easy. Easy. I qualify every search with easy, easy bean stew, easy angel food cake. What is easy to fix? What is healthy? Easy training techniques for a needy dog. Easy way to cross grief like a lake. I qualify every search with easy. Easy to understand recent study on the brief fluke prints left in a whale's wake. What is easy to fix? What is healthy? Easy day trips from here. Easy journey to see varying degrees of light break. I qualify every search with easy. Easy slumber. Easy to tell funny jokes. Easiest way to conceal an ache. What is easy to fix? What is healthy? Easy upward trajectory. Dressy pretend ease followed by the sharp intake. I qualify every search with easy. What is easy to fix? What is healthy? Um, and I'll just do a couple more. This is my ode to Lexapro and it is called Lexaprode. Praise be the little white pill for confirming my interest in going outside again. This time last year, I was like a gravity monger, pedaling low to only myself. My brain like the back of a warped bookshelf, the sign on the way to recycling always advertising surf and turf and hurt. In my head, a crocus was never magical. A woman on our street rescued a ferret. I couldn't even focus on her story of how it turned out to be a mink, generic es Pilotopram, you have surprised me, like the neon orange gel polish I got this week that glows in the dark. I thought we were having a lightning storm. It was my hands tucking in my sun, Danka daily five milligram construction worker sweating in the heat to wave me through expediently. The truth is my father died. We never know what's coming next. When God closes a window, he opens a door. He sometimes rips the roof right off a double wide. I have two more. Um, this poem is called Idiot Birdwalk. 
Our guide offers to let us take a peek through his high-powered telescope at a common loon, and my son asks, why would we if it's common? I love his humor, but not at 9 a.m. when I'm here to see a blue-winged teal. I've lent him my dad's binoculars, which hang around his neck like an albatross. Can we go now, he demands, just as an elderly enthusiast explains how a bluebird nest is organized like a designer cup. When my son was four, he climbed into a $500 checkered urn at the McKenzie Child Showroom. I am mostly either trying to convince him to get out or stay put. Our guide points to a subdued female red-winged blackbird who looks as though she fixed the wrong color mac and cheese for someone. I didn't think my son thought about my dad at all until he molded him out of clay for a My Life diorama. Please just do this for me, I plead, and as he runs away, mutters, idiot bird walk. The common loon was dwarfed by a boat, but still, I wanted him to show interest in a distant black speck. I miss the people I've lost. Where did they go? It hurts to raise my eyes to the blinding sky to try and spot a double-crested cormorant, so instead, I turn my binoculars on my son, now peering through his own at the water. And the last poem I'll read is um, Warble, which is what the book is titled after. Warble. To the way to play the theremin is to never touch the instrument. Interference creates melody. Even swaying can alter the electromagnetic field. Our house shakes from the vibration of trucks on the deteriorating highway. I mostly feel these tremors in the bedroom when I set out to write distracted by the sound of a circular saw or the shadows made by moving hands in videos of theremin players. I prefer not knowing what will come next, like how a curved mirror gathers and concentrates light. The distance between what I intend to write and what I actually do is a kind of confirmation and faith in prospect, in span, in air. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to the Metal Earth family, Becca. Wonderful to have you read. Thank you everyone for joining us and celebrating Becca's accomplishment and everybody else's wonderful poetry. Um, we will now open the floor to questions, answers, comments. Um, it looked like there was some activity in the chat box. I'll ask uh, Becca something. I, I noticed the um, the uh, reference to Sapsucker Woods and I wondered if you live uh, near, uh, near Ithaca. <laughs> I live in Ithaca. South okay. Sur yes, it's about um six minute drive from my house, so we often go walking there. Yeah, yeah. I I lived in uh, Hamilton, New York, for some years, and my husband lived in Ithaca, and before that time, so we uh, we've been in Philadelphia for a long time now, but we have fond memories of upstate New York. Oh, nice. <laughs> I have a question about method. Can you talk about how? You write your poems at home, I guess. You were you said you were writing in the bedroom. You've got a son. You've got all the responsibilities that go with being a parent and now a uh, uh, published poet and so forth. How do you carve out time? Do you have a ritual? What, what's it like? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you're welcome. I've got I've got a dozen more if you're ready. <laughs> that's, such a, that's such a great question. So. For a while I was writing, I was writing nonfiction. And yeah. I think after having a child, I always have, I've always had a brain that's actually, oh, my child's actually on right now. He's waving. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> He's on a little screen there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm more suited for snippets. And I think that I, I try to sit down. I don't have any specific time that I write. I do tend to write in the house. And I think that I, jot down a lot of lines and images and things on my phone throughout the day. I often walk around just like talking into my phone and saying things. I call myself an unhinged detective because I'll be on like a play date at the playground and I'll be like the mom in the corner, just like saying strange things into my phone. Um, but then I save these things in my notes app. And then when I do have that small space of time, I can look through lines and I start to um, call and piece things together, collage and call. And it sort of happens that way. But all the pre-writing is happening when I'm out and about. Like I might be in Staples, just doing your basic shopping for back to school stuff. And I just 
something strikes me and I write it down. So it's all that collecting that happens before the sitting down and the assembling. It, it's also about intentionality, isn't it? I mean, you can be in stables and be intent on poetry at the same time. Oh, for sure. And I got my MFA almost 20 years ago. And and I did a little writing in the last what, you know, it was really the last it was the last two years that I really started to sit down and tell myself you're actually a poet. Like I'd published things in a handful of journals, but I never really believed that this was a thing I could do. It wasn't a thing I ever thought like you'll do it as a career or make money, but I never really believed that this was my calling. And then I decided, I think actually helping my dad through his death, it was sort of this awareness of, um, Karen, I think you were saying like life force, like there's something magical that happens in poems. And I felt a sort of, um, I don't want to say higher calling necessarily, but I felt the importance of it differently. And I wanted to, I just enjoyed writing on a different level. And so I started to make the time for it in a more meaningful way. Well, that's great. It paid off. Great work. I appreciate that. Thank you. The chat question is, can you share a favorite memory about Sharon Olds or what was it mm. like studying with her? So she, it's so Sharon, I studied with Sharon, you know, we were, she wasn't my thesis advisor, but I was in a couple of her workshops, but then I was actually her full-time assistant for a year. So when I graduated NYU, Sharon and I had a really good relationship and I was looking for a job. I was maybe 27, 28, and she needed a personal assistant. And so I did that for a full year. I think her assistant now is Bianca Stone. Bianca's done that for a long time, but I, I did it for a year, which means that I say that my second MFA was going to Sharon's apartment um, on Riverside Drive and going through her mail and watching her right at the window. And at the time, my husband and I were long distance and I thought we were going to break up. And she would just sit with me and just hold my hand and say, if it's meant to be, it will be. Like she gave me like this. It was just like Sharon off the page. And so that to me was like the most incredible thing was watching her write and watching her just be a person. Um she's just so lovely. I mean, the Sharon that you read on the page, like she's so committed to her craft and poetry as life. Like she's just an amazing, amazing person. I haven't actually talked to her in several years, but when I moved to Iowa after I, I left New York, she would like send me random things sometimes. Like I, she cut a picture out of a J. Crew catalog one time and sent it to me. It was like, dear because she like writes with exclamation marks and she was like oh dear this reminds me of you like she's just a wonderful person <laughs> that's awesome thanks for sharing yeah um bart asks how often do you send your work out to literary journals and if so what's your process so I would say, so I'm about to turn 47. I would say at age 45, I, I woke up one day and I said, I am going to like make a spreadsheet and submit because I was that traditionally female version of you submit to one journal and you get rejected and you never submit there again. We know the statistics, right? Like a lot of women don't resubmit. And I just decided not to do that anymore. I was like, I'm just going to put on my armor. And so I have at any one time now, I have 50 things out at submittable. And um, I get rejections almost every day. I would every say day. I get an acceptance maybe once every few months. I mean, I think yesterday I got like three rejections and I, I aim high sometimes. Like I've got the thing out at Poetry Magazine, which won't get opened for like a year. Like I've got the New Yorker thing out. That's not going to get opened. But, you know, it's nice to get the rejections and at least have the conversation and put your stuff out there. So my process is that every day now I wake up and I spend 10 minutes looking at submittable, looking at the work in rotation, um, sending new stuff out. And I, I treat it like a business. I try not to get upset when I get rejected. And it happens just as much as the acceptances. And this book, Warble, like it was a finalist for a couple places, but it was flat out rejected in a lot of places as well. So we're glad it's ours. Yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> was, yeah, I definitely cried when I got the call because I mean, it's a dream, right? You just, you get so many rejections and you, you just have to, I think you have to like do it because you really like writing and it helps you learn about yourself. Like that's what I've discovered through this whole process is that I don't know who I'd be if I weren't trying to write a little bit every day. Absolutely. I think you're in good company. I think we all have very similar experiences there. Karen, did you have a question? Yes. I love the title warble because it's a bird, it's a trill, it's a kind of motion you could say it has to do with 
how most of us live our lives. We warble around. How did you land on that as a way to organize and focus the collection? Well, I liked that it sounded like wobble, which is kind of how I move around as well. I'm not a person that lives at all in my body. Um, I trip a lot. I'm very much like um, cerebral, bad dancer, like everything happens like here up. Um, and, you know, my dad was a really big birder. And so the, the, the book, the like genesis of the book was my father's death. And I just think that um, there, there's a poem in the book I didn't read about like after my dad died, I had to clean out um, his, his stuff. My mom actually, which you don't hear from my reading tonight, my mother collapsed after his funeral and almost died as well. So I was in charge of um, cleaning out his closet and everything. And I wasn't sure I had the emotional strength to do that. And I had gone out to get a cup of coffee and there was a, a bird that let me touch it. And uh, I took a picture of the bird because I have some birder friends in Ithaca. And it was just so strange because birds don't normally let you come up to them. And this bird very much approached me and let me touch it. And I sent it to my friend Caroline, who was like, that's a Connecticut warbler. It's a really, it's a bird that actually um, hides. It's it's not meant to, it's, it's not a bird you see in the wild like that, that lets you approach it. And so it was a moment for me of, um, do I think that my father was that bird? No. Do I think that bird was sent to me in some way? Possibly. I believe those things. So um, to me, the the warble came from that as well. Thanks for answering that. Yeah. This would be a good one for all of our readers tonight. Um, so Brian Daldorf, who was our finalist one year with his book, Kansas Poems, asks, who do you think of as your audience? So Becca, if you want to start and then we'll just go down the line. Who do I think of as my audience? So when I was writing this book, I thought a lot about my mom, actually, because uh, my mom survived and she moved up here to Ithaca. And so I'm helping caretake her now along with my husband. Um, and I knew that she would read this book if it was published, but I also knew there were things I couldn't hold back on. So always in my mind, I thought about my mom at the, like the book release. So she was always kind of there like a shadowy figure. But I also think about wanting the book to be mysterious and lyric but totally accessible like I, I actually want my mom's friends at her senior living to read this book and talk about it like I want them to have conversations but I also um I don't want it to be so straightforwardly narrative that there's no kind of like mystery behind it so I guess I think of like accessibility but also um yeah I guess almost everyone I want everyone to be able to read it that's the dream right Allison, do you want to answer that question? I was just thinking about that's a really hard one. Um, in I can ask answer it kind of practically for me because um, I always wrote poetry, but I didn't really think I was a poet uh, for a long time, and uh, only fairly recently have I finally come around to say, okay, maybe. Um, I I really, when I was younger, I thought I was a novelist and a fiction writer, um, but I'm not really very good with blot. <laughs> and what I really like to do is is fool around with language and the page. And um, I, I had a point where as soon after my son was born, I, uh, well, a couple of years after he was born, once I could leave him with my husband, I, I went on a writing retreat by myself. And it was really wild. I started writing this novel and I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, I hardly ate, hardly slept, that kind of thing. And uh, when I came back, I was trying to, you know, finish it and all these poems started coming. And it was like a quantum leap. I knew they were much, much better than anything I'd written before. Um, so I began to kind of pay attention and I got less interested in the fiction part of things and much more interested in poetry. So that Long story short, I, I joined a poetry group in Philadelphia led by the poet Len Leonard Gontarek. And uh, so uh, that is my practical audience. It's they're the first ones that see the early drafts of my poems. Um, and and then I have a couple of friends from there that see sometimes as they continue to. Um, and so that's the practical answer. But in another way, I think um, that poem about the uh, my uh, 
uh, flea circus poem. And I, I mentioned uh, my, my friend Sahira, who was uh, my best friend in high school. Um, and in some ways, I think she is kind of my ideal reader. And I don't think I really <laughs> realized that uh -huh. till tonight. Um, but as I say, she was just extreme, is still, she's amazing. She's an, a, um, a doctor, she's a, a radiologist, but she's incredibly verbally inventive. And I just love the way that she played around with language so much. So if uh, if I could please her, that would make me feel very good. <laughs> I agree with Becca that, you know, the, you know, the dream is everyone would be my audience. <laughs> um, I think that's, pretty much every writer's dream. Um, uh, and like Allison, I also, when I was younger, I wanted to be a novelist. You know, I, I envisioned myself as, you know, writing something like The Plague, which uh, hasn't happened yet. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I was living in Argentina and uh, my idea was to spend a lot of time there and write novels. And I just kind of gravitated towards poetry. I realized that that's what I would write because it was, it was truer, truer in a in a in a real sense. I mean, and I wanted to play around with language, like Allison was saying. Um, my 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 audience really is, in many ways, um, practically is my wife because you know she's a stand up comic and she's an amazing writer, very different. She actually writes incredible light verse, better than anything I could possibly write. Um, but she um, she's really my she's. She's the person who says, you know, this is amazing. You know, no matter what anyone else says, you know, not, no matter what, you know, whether before I had my first book uh, accepted for publication, before I really had many poems, she used to say, you know, you have too many poems like uh, the snails, the snails slowly slithered along this, you know, like there was too much alliteration at the beginning. Um, but I, I kind of had a tendency to write too darkly, you know, dark poems. And, you know, she's a stand up comic. So. I kind of slowly have made them funnier over time. And uh, I like to have a mix of both things. And, you know, the the greatest actors often are like Robin Williams, what, you know, have are very funny, but they have to be really funny. You have to have darkness inside too. And that's what we all are. We are a mix of those two things. Um, yeah, I, I'd say I'd echo a lot of those sentiments. Um, of course, we all want to be, you know, very widely read. Um, but I think from my experience writing, I think when you start a poem, there's always one person, you know, you can maybe try to trick yourself into thinking there's not, you're not writing it to that one person that you maybe don't want to write to. But um, from my experience, there's, you're always writing to a person, you know, 50%, 75% shot, they're never going to read it. But there's a, you know, a, a person who causes kind of the the impetus to a poem. Um, to cause it to exist. Um, and I think, you know, that connection, that interaction kind of sparks it. And um, yeah, I, I think for me, at least at the bottom, there's always somebody you're writing to. Um, yeah. Good point. A lot of them do come with one intended reader. And then we hope that it is broadened after that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone. We have reached the end. Thank you all so, so much for being here. Keep your eyes peeled for Becca's book launch sometime this fall. Um, keep supporting Metal Arc in all the wonderful ways that you do. And if there's anything that we can do to support you, please let us know. Um, you can find us at metalarcbookstore.com. All of our info is on there. We're on Facebook, Instagram. And we did not have all of our winners here tonight. So there's still some mystery in who the others are and uh, poems aplenty to be read. Thank you all so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>